Series Bloody 3. I mean, where do I start with this absolute unit of a series? I guess the biggest factor to it is that it's the first of many new things to come to the franchise. It was the first to be made with the Brit Allcroft Company's new name, Ghislaine Entertainment, the first time Mike and Jr. stepped up from the Series 1 and Series 2 synthesizer, the Roland Jupiter 6, to the EMU Proteus Orchestral, with some ditties used from the old Roland. The first to have UK actor Michael Angelus as the narrator, who would go on to be the longest running narrator of the entire series. And the first to have not just half the stories be from Wilbert's books, but also feature the other half written by director David Mitten, with Brit Allcroft co-writing two of them. Series 3 was broadcast in 1992, a whopping six years after Series 2 came out, which is the longest gap between series release that there has ever been for the show. But the series was first released in 1991 on VHS. I'll get back to that. How did it compare to the last two series? I mean, does it even need saying? Series 3 is my absolute favourite. This is the series that I remember watching the most of as a kid, so I am heavily nostalgic for it. I'll still be fair to critique it, as like the previous two, this series is not perfect in any way, but I apologise in advance if my bias gets in the way sometimes. So, let's get started with the stories. As series three is split into two different types of written stories, I'll talk about them separately. I'll begin with the Audrey stories. As I'm sure you've heard me mention throughout the last two reviews, some of these stories have been told out of order from previously told stories, those being A Scar for Percy, Percy's Promise, Gordon and the Famous Visitor, The Trouble with Mud, and Buzz Buzz. Time for Trouble, based on the railway series story Double Trouble, is kind of told out of order, but it instead has the opening changed to better fit Gordon Goes Foreign being cancelled for series two. Where instead of James taking the express to give Gordon a rest from his journey to and from London, Gordon is simply given a rest from having to pull more trains during the holidays. I like it, I think it works. Though if Gordon Goes Foreign wasn't cancelled, this would have been nice to see as a following story. Oh, it was planned to be in series two. With Percy's promise. They actually tried to fit continuity more into the show than I thought. Go figure. In fact, all of the told out of order stories have some changes to them to better fit the narrative. Some of them work well, others... not so well. A Scar for Percy works the best out of all of them, seeing as it was a very short one and done story in Henry's book, so it could happen any time. It doesn't have to worry about the appearance of characters that shouldn't be there yet, which it doesn't, as well as adds extra scenes to the start of the beginning that feel like a natural expansion of the story. Percy's Promise has the problems I mentioned with Percy Takes the Plunge in Series 2, which I've mentioned before so I won't repeat myself, as does Gordon and the Famous Visitor, but instead of focusing on Duck's interaction with City of Truro, it has City of Truro talk to all the engines instead, so there's no subplot of Duck getting too proud to lead into Pop Goes the Diesel. And the trouble with Mud is part of Gordon's character arc problem I mentioned in the Series 1 review, as well as changing the story to make Gordon out of character. Buzz Buzz works better than those stories as well, as instead of focusing on Boko's first time on Sodor, because at this point in the series he's already been here for a while, it expands on the story with James trying to get rid of the bees clinging to his warm boiler. So ultimately I think Series 3 does an overall better job with its railway series stories continuity than what Series 2 did. Not perfect, but better. The rest of the railway series stories that don't have to worry about being out of order, they manage just fine. They too have some expansions to fit the four and a half minute runtime and all feel fantastic, with the exception of Tender Engines. This episode, based on the story Tenders for Henry, changes the most when bringing Buck to TV, to avoid tackling a really heavy subject that was brought up in the books, with engines being scrapped. In that story, Gordon is unhappy because he's hearing about steam engines potentially being scrapped, which at the time was a real big life event. In the early 60s, British Railways announced their modernisation plan to bring electric powered diesels into main service and withdraw all their steam engines, which led to nearly all steam engines being scrapped. It was a big moment in railway history, but also a big moment for when it was incorporated into the books. Gordon asks the Fat Controller on whether or not the rumours he hears about steam engines being withdrawn is true, and instead of making a simpler fantasy reality where all engines aren't scrapped, they have the Fat Controller say it how it is. Not only are the rumours true about steam engines being withdrawn, but that all of Gordon's brother engines, built in the same shed as him in Doncaster, have all been scrapped, except one. We basically learn that all of Gordon's family is dead. And this is the same series of books where a little blue tank engine once went fishing! 
This is a very heavy topic brought into the books and is handled with 100% dignity towards just how serious this is. Gordon is distraught by what he's heard, and understandably so. However, just when it seems that there's no way to make him feel better, the Fat Controller arranges for his only surviving brother to visit him, the Flying Scotsman. Not only another real life influence for the stories as Flying Scotsman was saved from being scrapped by British businessman Alan Pegler OBE, but also further ties the book's stories even further to realism with a mature story. This is, no surprise, changed massively in the show. It kept the subplot of Henry getting jealous of how many tenders Flying Scotsman had, but three major changes were made. 1. Gordon doesn't recognise Flying Scotsman, who is just referred to as The Visitor, with no other shots of him on screen other than his two tenders. 2. Instead of Gordon starting off with hearing rumours of engines being scrapped, he learns them from Diesel. Yeah, he's back, I'll come back to that. And 3. Gordon asks about Diesel's taking over the railway, and the Fat Controller just says it won't happen on his railway. While I mostly understand why this choice was made, as they didn't want to make the show too much for adults, I think it would have been an interesting plot point to adapt into TV. They've had stories about facing Scrap before, like in Saved from Scrap and The Deputation. There's even another story about Scrap literally right after Tender Engines in Series 3. But I'm still alright with it. The morals are also told just as good as they were in the last two series, so overall, the Railway series stories are brilliant, if a bit wonky in some episodes. But now we come to the other half of stories that were written mostly by David and co-written by Brit. That must have been a surprise for Wilbert, I wonder what he thought of them? They're so obsessed with the popularity of Thomas that they have what I can only call crane-shunted Thomas to all sorts of unlikely places in order to get him into or force him into a particular story. Whether the story was written with Thomas in mind or not. Oh dear. Yeah, Wilbert wasn't all too pleased with half the stories being written by the creators. I'll play a clip from this documentary interview where he goes over what frustrated him with those stories. The first two sets of videos were, in my mind, quite good because they stuck in the main to my stories. There, there's a success, I think, made the producers somewhat big-headed. And in the third series, they thought that they could write my stories for, for them. In so doing, they only revealed their lamentable ignorance of railway practice. Guys, I don't think he liked it. But, I hear you ask, which of the Brit and David stories did he use as an example? Good question. What episode did he tear apart? For instance, the video called Henry's Forest. Hmm. The story was about Henry, an engine. Henry is, uh, in, the, in that story, is enraptured by the forest which he goes through. Now, what um, interest does a, lo a steam locomotive have in scenery? On one occasion in the story, the driver says to Henry, we've made good time over the last section, let's stop for a bit. Well, what responsible driver would stop as if he was um, in, a, in a roadside lay-by? You can't do it. They, they showed a lamentable ignorance of Rule 55. Rule 55 is a protection of, of trains when they come to a stand, they remind you of the signalman of the position of your train sending your fireman within a minute, two minutes to the signal box to uh, sign the book and 
ensure that the signalman is aware of your position on the track. That's, that's rule 55. If Wilbert was still alive, somehow, I think my top five list for Series 3 might have finished him off. So, what are my thoughts on the non-railway series stories? Personally, I really enjoy a lot of them. Like the additional scenes to the Wilbert stories, they feel very similar to his style of writing with the character's dialogue and story situations. A lot of them expand upon the characters in ways we never really got to see in the last few episodes, which is something I can really appreciate, as well as using the same moral storytelling as the books that's subtle enough to be considered on par with some of them, if not greater. Some morals are clearly not as subtle as others, but the attempt was there. Also, because they're not based on any pre-existing stories, they don't have to be critiqued for adaptation accuracy. Heroes, for example, expands upon Bill and Ben the Tank Engine Twins. While they love to be cheeky and play tricks on other engines, sometimes they get bored of doing the same job day in, day out, and want to change. So, when they get a chance to work somewhere different, they try to do things well, but the trucks trick them into making a mess of the yard, making Gordon's train late. The next day, when they head back to work at the quarry, a sudden rock slide strikes, and they get the workmen out of there as quickly as they can. They are congratulated by the Fat Controller, who says that while they still have a lot to learn about different jobs, they are heroes who are prepared to be brave and professional in emergencies. Hearing this said to Bill and Ben, previously only ever seen as cheeky, troublesome twins, is a proud moment for not just them, but for the audience watching them grow. Series 3's original stories are packed with development just like that. Even though, while they don't have to worry about adaptation accuracy from pre-existing stories, they tend to struggle with fitting the continuity flow of Series 3 as a whole. For example, in the episode Donald's Duck, Duck is promoted from shunting in the yards to having his own branch line, a sweet moment for him and sets up Oliver's eventual arrival to Sodor to help on said line. Then, two later episodes, Diesel Does It Again and All at Sea, have Duck working at the harbour with Percy. Something tells me that these episodes were released in backwards order, as I believe if you flip the order, it'd make more sense. Duck works with Percy at the harbour for a while, so when he comes back to work at the yard, the Fat Controller then rewards him with a branch line for his hard work. But then, why is Percy at the harbour and not Thomas's branch line? Many fans, myself included, like to believe he was sent to work there during the time in Thomas Gets Bumped, where Thomas's branch line is closed for repairs. But then in Trust Thomas, Thomas is seen running on his branch line, but Percy is still away at the harbour as James is doing his jobs. It's too bad. Percy goes to work at the harbour and I do his job here, there and everywhere. So, did Percy go to work with Duck before or after Thomas's line was closed? I think I might be able to build a headcanon theory on the order of events in Series 3. Let me know in the comments if you'd want to see that for a video. Fun bit of trivia for you guys, some of the Brit and David written stories were actually pre-existing magazine stories written in the late 80s, and while uncredited, the stories were written originally by Andrew Brenner. And I want you to remember that name because he's going to become a well-known name to the franchise when I get to the later series fuck knows when in the future. For now that covers my mostly positive views on series 3 stories, so for now we'll move on to the characters, both new and old. Not as many new characters join the show this time compared to series 2, and two of them don't even have any dialogue, but these new characters are about as strong and as memorable as the ones introduced before, so I don't really have any problems. I know Bulgy the Bus only gets one episode to his name and is never seen again throughout the rest of the series, but that's what happened to him in the books. Trying to bring him back wouldn't make for accurate story adaptation. Which is kind of what they did with Diesel, bringing him back to work with Duck and Percy at the harbour. While he is sent away again, which would make for his presence in this episode a good one-off appearance, there's clear shots and story moments when he's still there, so there's a bit of an inconsistency. We also get a brand new Diesel, Mavis, who goes through a permanent character arc of being a young, naive, inexperienced worker who stays at the quarry in this series, to a wise, advice-giving friend who gets to travel down the branch line. Always nice to see that sweet and simple character development. Then we have the absolute unit that is Oliver, a great western engine who goes through a daring escape from being scrapped with his brake van toad. The book goes slightly more in depth with how he escaped, but the adventurous escape is still felt here. He's a hard-working engine, happy to be as useful as he can, but can sometimes let compliments make him too overconfident, leading to an embarrassing accident. Definitely my favourite new character from the series. I actually don't have a least favourite character in this series. Nope, not even Trevor, who, even though he only gets one story to himself and a side role in a few others, I can't dislike the guy. I also don't have any favourite characters of the series. I have favourite and least favourite episodes for sure, 
but there's no characters that I think either steal the show or dampen it. Even Thomas is much more likeable, so I can't dislike him as much as the last two series. I like that it's much more balanced, gives other characters a chance to shine in the series without casting shadows onto another. Very much like what the books did, where no engine is ever clearly stated as the main character. The sets are my favourite to come from the whole classic series. I love the additions to the old familiar sets, making them feel larger in scale than the last two series combined, doing a fantastic job of sucking viewers into the environment. I don't think I dislike a single set design in this series. Even the episodes I don't like all that much have such striking set designs, they almost make up for those stories. The harbour, the goods yard on Thomas's branch line, the line by the coast, the village by the ocean, the snow-coated quarry, the little wooden bridge over the river, the canal, the mountain village, the bridge that goes by the huge waterfall, the forest, all are fantastic. My only gripe being with how Thomas's branch line seems to be massive with how many different locations he ends up at. But that's a critique against the stories, not the sets themselves, which are all fantastic. As is the music. Mike and Junior not only have much more range with the brand new synthesizer, but they give what is my favourite soundtrack of the whole series, with the different arrangements of Thomas's theme to fit the mood, the grandiose adventurous music during Oliver's escape, the adrenaline fueled remix of the classic Runaway theme to the serene beauty of the music that is played in countryside or nighttime shots. It all stands out to me. Series 1 and Series 2 had their moments, without a doubt, but Series 3 is consistent all throughout as are the renditions of older character themes. There are a lot of production standouts to this series. Gone are the red and orange tints of series 2 and instead we have brighter, much bolder colours. Which on the surface may seem like it's aiming more towards kids with this production choice, but then it still manages to carry that grimy, industrial look of a realistic railway with episodes in Storms, at the harbour, the quarry, the list is endless. The nighttime episodes are the best that have ever been. Series 2 is a close second for nighttime shots, but Series 3 wins for how magical and serene it manages to make the island of Sodor look. Or in Thomas Percy and the Dragon's case, spooky. Not as spooky as Ghost Train, but still spooky. My favourite night shots would have to be the ones from Thomas Percy and the Post Train, and this gorgeous shot of the mountain village in wintertime in Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure. But then there are once again instances of filming equipment in shot, and reused shots from not just the previous episodes, but previous series. But I am willing to give them more leeway than series 2, due to how ambitious they try to be with dedicating the smallest of episodes to one-off sets, so it seems natural that they'd need to rely on reused shots. However, you might notice something odd about the shots that seem like they're from previous series, but are nowhere to be found in any of those episodes. These are actually deleted scenes that were filmed in Series 1 and brought back for Series 3. Why do they do this? I have no fucking clue. But what I can say is that there was deleted scenes from not just Series 1, but also Series 3 that managed to find their way back into being used. So, what did Britt and David do with a collection of unused shots from the series? A music video. Yes, your eyes do not deceive you. In 1991, Brit Allcroft brought forward the idea for sing-along songs for the series, and the first song composed and written with lyrics by Mike and Junior was Thomas We Love You, or Thomas's Anthem in the US, sung by children. The first music video edited for this song was made entirely of not just Series 3 footage seen in the official episodes, but also deleted scenes with alternative looks on familiar sets. I love this idea for releasing deleted footage, it's like giving new life to the unused shots that probably took a lot of time and effort to make, despite not being used in the final episode. As for the song itself, I mean it's sung by children so it's obviously nothing groundbreaking. Hey come on now, this music video was recorded like 30 years ago. I'm fairly certain those kids have grown up and are mature enough to take a critique from a Thomas and Friends fan in his 20s, that did not sound as dignified as it did in my head. The song is iconic to the whole fandom, but I've heard better versions, like the Headmaster Hastings cover, that is magnificent. Thomas the Tank Engine rolling along All of his friends we are becoming along Thomas we love you Then we have the narration debut of the late great Michelangelo himself, Angelus hits the ground running with so much enthusiasm and energy in his delivery. Compared to Ringo, he sounds like he's going for a more appealing voice in a kid's show, but knows when to carry the dignified moments when he needs to. He also looks to give almost every engine their own distinct voice. Sometimes it works, like his deeper toned voice for the Fat Controller compared to Ringo's. 
Would you like to help build my new harbour? Thomas and Toby will help. James, once again, you are a really useful engine. But other times it doesn't, making Diesel sound less devious and villainous than Ringo, instead very nasally and like an unintimidating school bully. Your worthy sir Topham Hat thinks I need to learn. He is mistaken. Your worthy fat uh, Sir Topham Hat sent me. I hope you are pleased to see me. I am to shunt some dreadfully tiresome trucks. Perhaps the most recognisable aspect to his narration was his choice of voice for James, turning him from a smug, vain, posh voice... The Fat Controller told me to stay here. He sent a message this morning. ...to a full-on smug and vain... Scouser. Oliver, said James, has resource. That's no excuse, Percy. It's not funny having jam breaks. Are you afraid of bees? They're only insects after all. Buzz off! Buzz off! Eee! Or at least most of the time. What, me? Me? Push Toby and pull my train too? Actually, Thomas, I'm taking the coaches. The Fat Controller asked me to tell you. But, if you remember what I said towards the beginning, 1992 was not his first attempt at narrating for the series. His first attempts can be found in two rare early narration editions of Thomas and Friends VHS tapes released in 1991, Time for Trouble and Other Stories, and Trust Thomas and Other Stories. Not only do you get his very first narration recordings for the first 16 episodes, but you also get some unique bonuses. Sometimes he is more consistent with James's Scouse accent. What a good idea, agreed James. Look, here comes Thomas. I'll start pretending now. What a good idea, agreed James. Look, here comes Thomas. I'll start pretending now. Sometimes you'll hear inconsistencies with his fat controller voice. The fat controller sees the top hat. Mine, he said. Percy, look at this. The fat controller sees the top hat. Mine, he said. Percy, look at this. Sometimes you'll get to watch scenes without their music tracks. Trevor the traction engine is old fashioned, but he doesn't care. He knows that he is really useful. Like his friend Edward, the blue engine. Trevor the traction engine is old fashioned, but he doesn't care. He knows that he is really useful. Like his friend Edward, the blue engine. Sea breezes swirled his smoke high into the air and his green paint glistened in the sunlight. This is just like being on holiday, he puffed. Well, you know what they say, laughed his driver. A change is as good as a rest. Sea breezes swirled his smoke high into the air and his green paint glistened in the sunlight. This is just like being on holiday, he puffed. Well, you know what they say, laughed his driver. A change is as good as a rest. And on some occasions you'll hear additional lines not heard in the 1992 recordings at all. Even if there are very few of them. Never mind, James, whispered Toby. They're only joking. Ha ha! said James. Never mind, James, whispered Toby. They're only joking. Ha! said James. Toby just smiled. Take no notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. Look! He's coming now! Take no notice, soothed Edward. He's just jealous. He thinks no engine should be famous but him. Look! He's coming now! Oh, that's all right, Thomas. I like to make new friends, but I'm glad to share them with you. Bertie, said Thomas, you're a very good friend indeed. That's all right, Thomas. I like to make new friends, but I'm glad to share them with you. You're a good friend indeed, replied Thomas, and always will be. Then he pulled trucks for the rest of the day. He bumped them hard. Then he pulled trucks for the rest of the day. Good strains, good strains, he spluttered. He felt his position deeply. Also, because I searched for the raw footage direct from the VHS tapes to make the most accurate of comparisons, I also had to put up with each episode beginning and closing with the theme tune. Which is not so bad the first seven times, but the more and more I watched on, I was actually starting to get slightly sick of this iconic tune. Don't thank me for doing this, the earworm that burrowed into my skull has already done that. And yes, this does essentially mean that I ended up watching series three nearly twice in order to make this video, but I'll be honest, I had a lot of fun. Even with minor changes to the narration and not including music in certain places, it almost made it feel like I was watching these episodes for the very first time all over again. 
However, not every episode has an early dub, so there's only so much of Series 3 you can watch if you decide to go for that viewing option. But I actually consider these early dubs on par with the official dubs. Sometimes the lack of music lets you take in the sounds and atmosphere you might have missed before. But the official dubs are still brilliant as they've always been, and again, they actually have all the Series 3 episodes to watch. A fun bit of trivia to finish this segment, this is the last series to use the ditty that leads into the main credits that was always used in Series 1 and Series 2 episodes. It's used for the last time for the ending of the episode, Mavis. Mavis didn't answer. She took the trucks to the sheds and scuttled home to the quarry as quickly as she could. And now to avoid this video getting any longer, on to my top five episodes. Goodness gracious. I am going to have to quick fire these mentions as there were so many brilliant episodes that I found in this series, but I just couldn't put onto the list. Also, it gives me time to speak more about my top five episodes, where my top three episodes of series three are actually my favourite episodes of the show in its entirety. As I've stated before, I do plan on making individual videos talking about why I love those episodes, but I'll give them their mentions on the list here. So, to save me doing a sentence for each one of them, here they are very quickly. Great, now on to my top five. Goodness gracious. Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure. Yep, a Christmas episode is in my top five. Thomas's Christmas Party and Thomas and the Missing Christmas Tree have their perks and are good episodes, but Thomas and Percy's Christmas Adventure carries such a wholesome, tingly feeling that the other two just can't seem to reach. Instead of being a story where the engines are getting the station or the shed ready for Christmas, it tells the story of Thomas and Percy on an adventurous rescue to save a mountain village trapped by fallen snow from a huge snowstorm. And as a thank you for saving them, the villagers, helped by Toby, sneak into the sheds while the engines are still asleep and decorate it with paint, cards, presents and a Christmas tree for when they wake up the next morning. My heart melts with happiness every time I watch this. The best Christmas episode of the show, without a doubt. Goodness gracious. Oliver owns up. An episode that is technically the second part to what is number two on my list, but I feel like it can still be watched on its own. A very mature story that teaches a unique lesson on even though you should consider yourself lucky for escaping danger and finding a new life for yourself, that doesn't mean that you are without flaws. Oliver gets too cocky after being praised for his adventures, so he thinks he can do anything. The truck soon puts him in his place and he falls into a turntable well. While it does have the ending changed because the story that's meant to be after this, Toad Stands By, isn't adapted until Series 4, that doesn't lessen how brilliant the story is. Combined with the same gorgeous sets we're used to from Series 3 and that oh fantastic music, this is a classic among classics. Now for the big ones that you have all been waiting for. Here are my top three episodes of the entire show. Goodness gracious. All at sea. This gem of an episode is the best episode to use the harbour sets. The bustling cranes and trains around the harbour combined with the boats big and small with the vast open ocean are visual marvels. But most of all, it expands the character of Duck, going against just having him boast about his Great Western heritage and exploring a new side to him. His love for the sea and explorative dreams to travel beyond the horizon. A man taking place in a boat race injures his hand and has to be taken to hospital. Duck speeds along the line to meet Bertie who compliments him on how quickly he managed to get here and how useful it makes him. The story ends with Duck realising while he still dreams of lands beyond the horizon, he'd much rather stay where he is to work with and spend time with friends. A wise lesson learned ending on this phenomenal shot. Goodness gracious. Escape. This episode needs no introduction to the fandom. It is the most universally loved story among Thomas fans, and rightfully so. Douglas takes a goods train to the mainland where only diesel engines work, where he finds a rusty, terrified steam engine in a siding with his brake van, trying to escape the grim fate that has already befallen other engines that aren't on Sodor. Scrap. This is an iconic episode with just the right tension, just the right atmosphere, and just the perfect music. 
supposedly inspired by the Indiana Jones theme, which I can sort of hear out of it. The fact that it's Douglas who saves him from scrap is also very fitting, as both he and Donald have faced the possibility of being scrapped in the past. Now he's helping someone else escape scrap, just as his friends did for him way back then. Anytime I see people rank this as one of their favourites, even if they place it above my number one spot, I completely understand why. But to me, it was just shy of beating number one. Goodness gracious. Henry's Forest. There is so much I want to say about this episode in a future video, but I'll try my best to give my thoughts on it here. This episode hits a very personal spot for me. Not just because Henry is my favourite character, but the story of having a favourite place to go to to sit back and take in the peace and tranquility is... fantastic. The story it tells of Henry losing a special place to him to natural causes of nature makes my heart sink. Henry doesn't go on an overwhelming speech about how sad he is. That poor face and that saddening music is enough. But in the end, when it seems like things can't get better, his friends band together and do what they can to get that special part of the forest back. When the trees grow tall again and the animals come back to their home, we end where we began, having gone on an emotional journey with a beautiful ending. Now Henry can see the trees growing strong and tall, and the animals are coming back. Sometimes everywhere is quiet, at other times Henry can hear leaves rustling or a bird's wing brushing the air. Often he can hear the sound of children laughing, and always he is happy here. To conclude, I just really love Series 3. Maybe it's to do mostly with nostalgia, but this was the right step in almost all the right directions for the show. Adapting the book's stories with little extended bits that feel just right, the original stories that fit the universe, the growth of the new characters, the expansion of the older characters, the colours, the striking looks, the sounds, the music... It just feels right to me. I don't think there's any series in the show that is perfect, and Series 3 definitely has things going against it, but it is what I believe to be near perfection. Or heck, maybe the perfection it reaches is that it is imperfect, and allows for future series to be made to try and fix those imperfections. The fact that this is my longest review yet should let you know how much I love it. This rightfully takes its spot as my favourite series of Thomas and Friends. And after all that, we're ready to jump into a pivotal moment for the franchise, which I'll save any mention of for next time because... Just look how long this video's gone on for. So, I'll see you guys next week for Series 4.